Now, Augustine Dickinson is a convert to the Ethiopian uh, Orthodox Tewahedo Church, um, despite his white skin. Um, he fits in very, very well and has been really the uh, uh, given me the great privilege of visiting a, a few Ethiopian churches in town and has even had enabled us to have some prayer, Ethiopian prayer at the Shepchitsky Institute. And um, I just look forward to learning more from him. Um, there's a, a, a world of things to learn about this tradition. And uh, so we would just invite him to share some small, uh, uh, some, some small snippets of his vast uh, experience and, and erudition with, with us. Thanks so much, Augustinus. Yeah, that's my pleasure. Um, there's still a lot of the things I realize I don't quite um, have a great grasp on, but I, I think we'll be good for this introduction. And I'll actually say that hopefully I don't sort of overwhelm everyone with the amount of um, things that I'm presenting. But of course, it's the case that the Ethiopian tradition has this um, wide range of unique materials that are sort of difficult to present otherwise. Um, so just to give sort of a, a quick outline, um, so I'm going to focus first on um, the liturgical services themselves, um, just sort of the main categories uh, that we see, uh, and then talk about the books that are involved in, in the liturgical services, um, the chanting and also the hymns, um, and then the vestments and other liturgical items that are involved. Um, and then this is uh, the point where um, I have some example clips, which uh, will work as, <laughs> as I gather. Um, and then at the end, I have some comments on um, the, the, the church as it is uh, today. Um, and also, I mean, I realized that a lot of these things will overlap. And so I'll be mentioning some things repeatedly and, you know, trying to, to, to sort of make sense of it all. And hopefully it's, it's not too bad to follow. Um, so obviously the first place to start is with the divine liturgy and as it's known as uh, the Kedaze. Um, the word Kedaze literally means sanctification, or I think you said hallowing. Um, uh, Little is known about the early forms of the Kedaze. Of course, Ethiopia was um, Christianized uh, since the, the fourth century, um, but there's not a lot of evidence regarding what's the, what their liturgy looked like for much of the first uh, millennium even. Um, we have uh, manuscripts that preserve anaphoras of St. Mark and St. James, and these have been shown to follow closely the Greek originals. Um, so we can assume that these are uh, the earliest, some of the earliest examples of liturgies that might have been served in Ethiopia, but notably they aren't in current use. Mm -hmm. um, during the Middle Ages, uh, we see that there were uh, pseudo-apostolic works that were finally brought to Ethiopia through translation from Arabic, both actually and confusingly from Melkites and from Copts. Um, and these pseudo-apostolic works, then um, out of these came two more anaphoras. So the anaphora of the apostles, which is taken from the apostolic constitutions, perhaps a familiar uh, apocryphal work. Um, and also the anaphora of the Lord, which is based on um, the text that's usually referred to by a Latin name, Testamentum Domini, or in Ge'ez it's known as Mitzvah Kidan, or the, the Book of the Covenant would be the English translation. And so uh, since these two anaphoras had this apostolic weight attached to them, uh, they became the only anaphoras that were used um, during the, the later Middle Ages. So in the 15th century, Emperor Yaakov uh, only allowed these two anaphoras to be used. Um, and it's after this that we see uh, the composition of new anaphora, anaphoras. And these all follow a framework that was that's set by the anaphora of the apostles. So the anaphora of the apostles is sort of the anaphora par excellence, and that's used as a guide for, uh, for the other anaphoras. Um, as I said, there's a significant number of anaphoras that we can see in use now, well over a dozen. Um, most notably, it seems that uh, at least one and perhaps even several of them have been composed by Abba Georgis of Sagla, and I'll say more about him later. Um, but this was shown by uh, Geta Haile, who studied extensively the, st the writing style of Abba Georgis and has shown that um, there are stylistic links between his, his other writings and several of these anaphoras. But of course, the anaphoras are given pseudo-epigraphic pseudo attributions to prominent church fathers. So these are the anaphoras of Athanasius, Epiphanius, uh, Jacob of Serug, and, and so on. Perhaps even the famous anaphora of Mary, which is attributed to Syracus of Vanessa, um, but that's maybe a more contentious one. Uh, these new anaphoras, which were Ethiopic compositions, uh, some of them deal notably with uh, theological controversies that were, it, that were unique to Ethiopia or prominent in Ethiopia at the time that they would have been composed. And I have some examples of that to follow. 
Um, and in, in current use, the most frequent anaphora is actually the anaphora of Dioscorus. Mm. Um, I would say that it's simply because it's the shortest and the easiest. And so most, it's the one that most priests will be most familiar with. Um, and so even um, if they might, uh, if, even if it might be the case that they should serve a different anaphora, it's not uncommon for them to simply serve uh, the anaphora of Dioscorus. There also seem to be evidence of um, other anaphoras that were that are preserved in certain um, monastic communities, which don't which aren't preserved elsewhere, and perhaps also in use. But this hasn't been thoroughly studied, and there's not been a, a strong movement to either um, open these up to a broader use in the church or to suppress their use either. Um, you know, sort of the, the very isolated communities are sort of free to do as they as they wish. Um, so the first example that I have here of a theological controversy. Um, having an effect on an anaphora is the anaphora of St. Athanasius and the, the controversy of the Sabbath. So um, around the time that Abba Georgis uh, was alive and writing, uh, there was a controversy over whether uh, the church should also be observing Sabbath on Saturday, not as opposed to Sunday, but in addition to Sunday. Um, and eventually became the case that uh, this was officially the position of the church, um, despite uh, opposition from the Coptic church. And so uh, the church accepts two Sabbaths, which are considered to together form one 49 hour Sabbath. Um, so Saturday is referred to as Kedamit Sunbet, the original or the first Sabbath. And then Sunday is Sunbet Christian, the Sabbath of the Christians. And so Abba Georgis, when he wrote theological works, he wrote in defense of, sun, of, Saturday, of, sorry, of Saturday Sabbath, but he seems to have composed an anaphora praising Sunday to sort of balance the two, that you can't praise one over the other. And in fact, as these examples will show, um, the, the, this anaphora in particular um, honors uh, Sunday over all of them. So the very beginning of the anaphora is actually um, from the deacon, and the deacon says, today on this day, you have gathered in this church, uh, and the, the window, I can't, can't see my own notes because the, the videos. Um, uh, have gathered in to the church, be attentive to the anaphora, and the word here is actually of the Holy Sabbath of the Christians, San Beta Christian. Um, and then it goes on to uh, give these long descriptions, uh, first of the creation of creation and the fall of Adam and Eve, of course, because uh, Sunday was important for the creation story. Um, it also uh, points out that Sunday is, is, and I don't know if there's a real source for this, but it points out that Sunday is a day on which um, a lot of events in the Old Testament took place, it was the day that Abraham received his revelation, that Moses did, and, and other figures. Um, and then it also has a lengthy and somewhat depressing um, discussion of the, the day of final judgment, which it also says will take place on Sunday. Um, and then it concludes with the priest who says, O Holy One, and it's here referring to the Sabbath of the Christians, uh, come to us every week so that we might rejoice in you unto ages of ages. Um, and this is not the only example, but we also have other hymns that were written in honor of the, sa the, sa the Sabbath of the Christians. Um, but here we see it having a direct role in um, the divine liturgy itself. Um, the other me, example uh, I have Augustino's, is from, what's the, uh, the date of the, that composition? Well, so none of these have a firm date. Um, I'll talk about Abbe Georgis exactly when he lived, but a bit later. But so he, this would have been um, uh, late 13th, or sorry, late 14th century. 14th, yeah, okay. Um, the, the two Sabbaths were officially uh, uh, added to the canons of the church in 1450, but they were, um, but b before then they were already being integrated. So it was just that 1450 that there was finally uh, like, okay, no more discussion on this, the matter is settled and there'll be two Sabbaths. Um, so for uh, the anaphora of Mary, and this is the one that um, you had some readings about. So the anaphora that's attributed to Syracus of Vanessa because there's other <laughs> Marian anaphoras. Um, so for this one, we actually see that even though it's dedicated to the Virgin Mary, there are these long, incredibly long digressions about Trinitarian theology. And again, it's also the case that during the time of Abba Georgis, there were um, some sects that seemed to have um, anti-Trinitarian views. Um, and so it's not quite a surprise then that these are integrated into the anaphora. I mean, it's an odd choice to put them in the anaphora of Mary, but nonetheless, they're there. Um, I'm still trying to figure out if I can minimize uh, the video so I can see the words. Unless you want, unless you want to read for me, Brian, because I can't see. It's cut off. It is not that we say three like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but one in three persons, 
It is not that we say one like Adam, the first of all creatures, but three in one essence. Behold, we hear the wicked Jews and the erring Ishmaelites who say in their ignorance that God is of one person, one substance. They are blind of heart. Behold, we see the idolatrous pagans for whom there are many gods and many demons. But we follow those who lead to the good path as the apostles have taught us. Now let us return to the earlier matter and discuss the Holy Virgin. Thank you. So, um, so as you can see, it has this um, very uh, like sort of serious theological um, tone about regarding the Trinity. And then at the end, it even acknowledges that this was a digression from the actual purpose and focus of the anaphora. Awesome. Um, but as I said, this is focusing on the, the theological controversies that were um, contemporary to when this was likely to compose. It's extremely polemical. Like it's, it's not the kind of thing we would, it's, it's more polemical than anything we'd find in, in the mm. orphanage. The anaphora of Athanasius is too, actually. So it says, um, and if there's any who, uh, who disregards this faith or who, uh, who follows a different faith, then they will be dragged down with chains of fire into the depths. You know, it's, 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 it's really depressing, actually. And Jacob of Sarah, too, that, that one also has a lot of polemical tones to it. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's a clever way, you know, means of using liturgy as a tool this way. Um, but so that's uh, divine liturgy. So um, liturgy of the hours, which is known as Sa'atat, and Sa'atat just means the hours. Um, we do have extant um, a translation of the Coptic Horlogion into Ge'ez, known as Sa'atat Zagebs. So Gebs is just Egypt. Um, the thing is that we don't know exactly uh, when it was composed or how widespread it, it was or how it was even used. Mm. Um, and in any case, uh, it's, it's not used anymore. Um, uh, there's this curious case that we can point to that um, we might associate the liturgy of the hours most strongly with monasticism. But the, the foundation of monasticism, the nine saints, is not so strongly connected to Egypt. Um, so that they're using the, the, the Coptic Horologion isn't even a, a certain bet, um, you know, in antiquity. Hmm. Um, in any case, uh, if it was used or if something else was used that we don't know about, these were all supplanted by um, the Atat of Abba Georgi. So again, the same <laughs> Abba Georgi, so Sigla. Uh, so in this case, uh, there's simply a day and night. So Atat for the day and Atat for the night. Um, and it's... Uh, he, so Abba Gyorgis, he composed a set of prayers and then a framework for them. Um, what is actually uh, considered to be a part of Sa'atat now, um, which includes a number of added hymns and other components, is not all part of what he wrote, but these are expansions that draw sort of on the framework that he developed. Um, and, and a full Sa'atat, including all of the usual added hymns and prayers, can be incredibly long, taking even over six hours. Um, and there's a lot of local variations that between regions, mass communities, and parish churches. Uh, most parish churches will use an abbreviated form, so they'll choose which um, elements of satat they prefer to use, um, simply because it's, it's not practical. Um, and this is usually served before the divine liturgy in, in parish churches that do this, um, akin to what we would see elsewhere, where there's a Vespers and Matins service before uh, the divine liturgy on Sunday. Um, and these abbreviated forms also might be used throughout the week if they also prefer to serve Sa'atat on other days. Um, that's what we did at the Shibchisky Institute, actually. Um, and then this is somewhat confusing, but in addition to Sa'atat, the Liturgy of the Hours, we have these divine office services, Wazema, Moedes, and Sibhat and Meg. Um, I'm not going to say much about these because it's really complicated and unclear. And in any case, they only have very limited use now. Um, except in, in very traditional monasteries or on very prominent feast days. Uh, so the first is uh, Wazema. Oh, sorry, I should say that these are um, referred to by Western scholars, such as Taft, as the cathedral office. Cathedral. Um, but I don't know that that's necessarily a valid comparison. But uh, Wazema, uh, so Wazema is the festal vespers that served as a vigil. Um, and it will actually be served in addition to Sa'atat. Um, so there would be um, Sa'atat uh, starting very early, but it would still be the night form, and then a Wazima after that. Uh, the second is Moedes, uh, which is a Sunday nocturnes, and it forms actually a part of uh, Dugwa, which is something I'll bring up later. Uh, and then the third is Sibhat Neg, which is a form of matins, mostly used on Sunday, but there are additional forms for other days of the week. Um, but as I said, these, uh, these have more or less been overtaken by the Sa'atat of Abba Georgis. Um, but even Sa'atat and these uh, can be subsumed, and I kind of use that a bit carefully, 
by uh, the service of Mahalet. Um, so I say that Mahalet replaces the Liturgy of the Hours in, in quotation marks or in scare quotes because um, technically uh, priests will be serving Sa'atat behind the altar while Mahalet is being served in the, the main part of the church uh, by, by, by cantors. But to basically everyone in the church, you would only notice that, uh, that Mahalate was being served and you wouldn't even know. I didn't even realize for the longest time that Satat was actually going on. And so it's more or less, as I say, replaced by uh, Mahalate. Um, and so the word Mahalate itself means a song or canticle. Um, but in a, and, and there are um, a core set of hymns that are referred to as Mahalate. So this is Mahalate to the gay, for example, is the most famous. But then it's also used to refer to a broader service that comprises multiple hymns, some of which are borrowed or some of which are borrowed from Sa'atat or would also be used in Sa'atat. Um, and then some of which are only for, uh, for Mahalait. Um, and of course, also what's added or what's not added depends on the feast days. It depends on which church, local variation, and you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and there's also some things taken from the antiphonaries, which again, I'm gonna mention a bit later. Um, so uh, within Mahalate, there's a number of different and diverse styles of chanting and also different types of hymns. Um, I'm going to try to give some, some actual examples of these later, um, but it's, it's an incredibly diverse and long um, service. And it's really where we see the, the, the fullness and the beauty of Ethiopian Orthodoxy, I would say, come out is because, you know, the liturgy is more or less kind of, um, you know, straightforward and Atat is more or less really straightforward, but it's Mahalate where there's this huge number of um, all sorts of hymns and, and new Ethiopian innovations. Um, and the, uh, also sometimes in Mahalate, there's uh, the use of instruments, which I'll also talk about later. Um, but Mahalate is always performed by a scola of cantors, um, which is the photo I have here is a group of cantors in uh, La Ibella. Um, and uh, because of the complexity of Mahalate, it requires generally that the cantors be very well trained. Um, and some portions also include a form of liturgical dance. And again, this is something I'll um, have a bit more detail on later. Um, and one thing to note is that both Sa'atat and uh, Gadaze, both the Divine Liturgy and the Liturgy of the Hours, incorporate what's known as the Prayer of the Covenant, or in Gaz, it's known as Salota Kidan. Um, and this is often simply referred to as Kidan. Uh, it is always a part of Sa'atat and always a part of the Divine Liturgy, though it also can be served as an independent service, and it's just very short then. Uh, I wanted to ask you, sorry, about, you, you missed the point about dance. Yeah, Almost. so it's hard to really, um, it, it's hard to really describe. Um, I have like a video example that will show it. I, I think dance is, is not really the best word in English. Like I've heard people even say like, well, Orthodox churches should incorporate dance, the Ethiopians do, but then they have no concept of, it's not like dance, like, you know, like, a, a, you know, like a, a dance dance, it's, it's, it's quite different um, and, and restrained and restricted. Um, it's more like so, choreography than a, than a dance, right? Yeah. That's, yes, that is a great way to, to clarify yeah. it. Thank you. Thank Ritualized, you. yeah. yeah. <clears throat> mm. Um, and it's very simple. I mean, there's not a whole lot really even to say on it. Uh, and it's best just to show um, a video. Um, but so for, for, for uh, the Kidon, so the Kidon starts with the Trizagion, right? Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal. And of course, it uses the extended Oriental Orthodox version, although it's actually in, in the Ethiopian tradition even a bit longer than the usual Coptic one. Um, and this is followed by a dialogue. So, right, so um, the grace of the Lord be with you and with your spirit, blah, 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 you know during which the priest uh, gives out um, blessings using his hand cross. Um, and then uh, the priest will recite excerpts from the Testament of the Lord, the Mitzvah Kidan, or as I mentioned before, the Testamentum Domini. Um, and these are, are not actually read from a book the, because it's always the same ones and there's only three uh, services. They, they usually just have them memorized. And while, the, sorry, and I should say after the priest says this, although in practice it's usually during or while the priest says it, uh, the people will say, we glorify you and we praise you, um, O Lord. And so there are three forms of the Kidan. There's the midnight, the morning, and the evening Kidan. And so it's the morning Kidan that's used in um, the, the Divine Liturgy. And so it actually replaces the Trisagion, since the Kidan itself includes the Trisagion. Uh, and then um, the evening and midnight Kidan will be used in uh, Sa'atat. 
Um, and so just to have some notes on the major feasts, since these come up a lot when people discuss <laughs> the Ethiopian church. Um, of course, the most prominent feasts are Easter and Christmas. That's true, you know, I think of every tradition. Um, but in addition to this is also two further feasts that often are noted for having an extra sort of um, special character. Uh, the first being Meskel, the exaltation of the cross, which commemorates the discovery of the true cross by the mother of uh, Constantine the Great. Um, in this case, uh, churches by, light a bundle of straws and sticks, which is often topped with a cross, as you can see in the bottom photo. Um, and this is based on the story of Helena uh, lighting a fire and then the smoke being a guide as to where the cross was hidden. Um, and the, the, it seems that the reason why this feast has a particular um, importance in the Ethiopian church is that in the 14th century, uh, Emperor Dawid II uh, received a piece of the true cross from the, the Coptic Patriarch. Um, and then during the reign of his son, Zar Yaakob, it was uh, placed within a, a very famous church um, that's actually in a cross-shaped mountain. Um, and it's now a very prominent pilgrimage site. And so this seems to be why Mezcal is particularly a popular um, feast. And of course, the other one is, I think you saw a video, is uh, Temket, not, not Tomcat or Timcat. I really hate hearing what Western people say. Temket, Temket, Tim or Theophany. Um, so uh, okay. I don't really have say, much to say on this. It's, um, it's, not, it's actually quite similar to most other churches. There's a blessing of the waters and people will jump into the water for a blessing. Um, except that also this is perhaps the most prominent um, instance where a tabo is processed. Um, and I'll say more about the, the tabo later. Um, but in this case, often we see multiple tabots even being processed by one church. Um, and again, I'll have better examples of that a bit later. Augustinos, um, can I just ask under COVID, are the Ethiopian churches being um, a little bit more liberal with people being allowed to go to services than maybe other denominations? Because the students are looking for opportunities for field trips. So if you can get them in to an Ethiopian church in Toronto, then... Uh... They've, they've actually been, to my surprise, strict about following the guidelines. Oh. So only live streaming for weeks now and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. But, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe things will, will lighten up. I, I mean, there's lots of recordings of the Divine Liturgy. I tell you why even I wasn't going to say much about the Divine Liturgy. It's really easy to find recordings and examples of the liturgy. It's things like Mahalay that are almost impossible. Um, mm. you, get, you can get some stuff, and I've tried to get some stuff if you can search with Amharic. But if you can't, then you basically miss out on it. What we'll um, ask you to do as a follow-up is just to maybe send us your top three or four recordings sure. of Divine Liturgy, because those who, who won't be able to go for a physical field trip are looking for high quality, you know, accessible recordings that they can then do a bit of a reflection on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, and the other thing to know is uh, the prominence of Marian feasts. So of course, um, we have the same usual uh, feasts for the Virgin Mary, Conception, Nativity, the entrance to the temple, Annunciation. Um, but there's also an expansion of the number of feast days to 33, and this was during the reign of Emperor Zar Yaakob, who again has come up a lot, but that's because um, he had quite a lasting influence on the church. Um, so part of this expansion was the separation of the feasts of Dormition and Assumption. So as far as I'm aware, the Ethiopian church is the only one to celebrate both and separately Annunciation and Dormition. Most no, the Copts oh, sorry, do as well. Uh, dormition and Assumption. Oh, do they? They do. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. They have in January the they have one they have the uh, they have the um, uh, assumption in January and the dormition in uh, in August. Reverse though, so so at least in the Ethiopian Church, it's dormition that's in January. Sorry, that's what they that's it. Yeah. yeah okay. That's it. Oh, okay. So then yep. it is the same in the Coptic. Church. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, but uh, also part of reaching this number of thirty three was. Uh, uh, and this I'm quite certain is a uniquely Ethiopian commemoration, the, the Covenant of Mercy, known as uh, Kidane yes. Mehret. Um, so this is a commemoration, I don't want to get to give too long of an explanation, but this is based on um, some apocryphal texts which refer to the Virgin Mary uh, being given a vision of hell. Um, and when she sees hell and is, uh, you know, terrified, not for her sake, but for the, for the sake of other people, um, she asks how, what she can do to prevent people from going to hell. And so then God gives Mary a covenant whereby people can seek mercy from her and then be delivered from hell. And so this is what uh, Kidana Mehret or the covenant of mercy celebrates. And so then um, Kidana Mehret itself is celebrated on the 16th of the month of Yakatit. Um, and most of the other Marian feasts will fall on the 21st of whatever month they're in. Uh, and for the rest of the months that might not have a Marian feast, 
then on the 16th and on the 21st, they have a, a, a reduced or a smaller Marian fees. And so this is actually why 33 is already such a big number because there's two already guaranteed for each month, so that's 24. And then, you know, there's just uh, a, a few extra that reaches 33. Um, and also uh, this same kind of pattern for having monthly feasts is also used for some other, uh, used for the Holy Trinity and for some prominent saints like Michael, Gabriel, and George. Um, and this would be the same pattern of whatever day, they're, whatever day of the month their annual feast is on, then every month there'll be a smaller feast on that same day of the month. Um, but that would depend on local, uh, you know, custom and, and preference. Um, and so that's what I have to say about uh, divine liturgy and liturgical services. Um, moving on to liturgical books. Um, so as is, of course, the case in every church, um, there's uh, an importance on the, having a missal, or a, it's called the Book of the Liturgy, uh, which contains the full text of the Divine Liturgy with all of the anaphoras. Um, in, the, in the Ethiopian church, they emphasize memorization, but given the large number of anaphoras, it's often the case that um, priests aren't ca simply aren't capable of memorizing <laughs> all of them. It, you know, it's, it's kind of reasonable to assume. It's a reasonable thing that you can't expect them to, to memorize over a dozen long anaphoras. Um, so often, yeah, they, they use a, a missile, but if they can avoid it, then um, they will. Um, also is the, the book of exposition and it's called the Gitzawe. And so this is um, the book that details for every day of the year, uh, which passages from scripture are read, um, as well as the Mizbak, which is perhaps better known as the Prokimenon, the excerpt from Psalms that accompanies the gospel. And then also the Gitzawe spe uh, specifies which anaphora is used on that day. Although, as I said earlier, that's not always very closely followed. Um, I mean, there'll be obvious, there's some obvious ones. So on Mary and feast days, they'll use the anaphora of Mary. Um, but, but for the most part, um, people don't quite follow the gets away so closely, certainly not in the case of the anaphora, although it, it does prescribe them. Um, other additional books. So um, a big one for Ethiopians is uh, The Miracles of Mary or to Amr and Maryam. Uh, I would say that it's probably safe to say that among Ethiopians, they consider this to be the holiest book after the Bible itself. Um, I, I mean, I won't say anything now about how the book, what the origin of the book is. If someone wants to know, um, you can ask later. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's still a long and complicated explanation. Um, but but uh, the book itself came to Ethiopia um, just before the, the 15th century. Um, and, and it was during, again, the reign of Zar Yaakob that it was made mandatory to read the miracles of Mary before any divine liturgy. And there's actually a threat of excommunication on those who disregard this um, command. It's mentioned both in the hymnography and even in the book uh, mm -hmm. that there's an excommunication. Um, the, according to the introduction to the text, this is actually based on an order from the, the Coptic Pope, but there's no uh, surviving Coptic evidence uh, of this. Um, but from what I've read, um, people, people are convinced that this isn't actually an Ethiopian invention, that, that the cops, you know, they didn't make up that the cops had this. It seems that the cops might have actually had it and then it fell out of use. But in any case, the Ethiopians, the Ethiopians who expanded its importance. Mm -hmm. And so um, the addition of hymns and, and prayers to accompany the reading was also done by Zari Jacob. Um, the reading is usually integrated into Sa'atat. Uh, and then, um, even then it's only done by a priest. Um, so sometimes other miracles will be read from other saints, uh, aside from the Virgin Mary, but only a priest is allowed to read uh, from the miracles of Mary. Um, according to the actual book, it says that they're meant to be read three at a time, but in practice now it's, it's just one at a time. <laughs> it's just only one per day. Um, and as I said, so other books of miracles may be read and this depends on local preference um, or, or if there's a commemoration for a particular saint. Uh, so the, the most prominent after the miracles of Mary would unsurprisingly be the miracles of Jesus. Um, also for miracles from Michael, Gabriel, uh, George, and Ethiopian saints, Tekla Haimanot, Gerum and Feskadus, among others. Um, also deserving a mention is a book called Haimanot Abau, which means the faith of the fathers. Uh, so this is based on a Coptic florilegium of popular patristic writings. Uh, it was translated around the 16th century, but came to importance during the 7th century. Uh, contains excerpts from Epiphanius, Basil, Gregory, John Chrysostom, Cyril, uh, and others, as well as, of course, um, Oriental Orthodox Fathers, Severus, Jacob of Serb. Um, it typically would have been read during uh, the time when the priests prepare for communion, when there's a bit of sort of downtime while they're doing the physical preparations. 
uh, there might have been someone who read from Hymenota Abba, and some churches still do this, but often now it's rather replaced by an extemporaneous homily. Um, people prefer to have someone, you know, talking dynamically, a, 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 hom a fresh homily, than having one read from a book. Um, in terms of what might have been done before uh, the use of Hymenota Abba, there are also other books of homilies that are quite common in Ethiopic. So perhaps these were also used um, during that same time. Um, also, of course, we have uh, books that detail the various forms of sacraments for baptism, for marriage, ordination, funerary services, and, and so on. Um, the forms of these have, uh, and how they developed have not at all been well studied. Um, and in fact, some seem to be quite late developments. Even surprisingly, the book that's used for funerary services, Mitzavah Genzet, seems to be quite a late development. And so what was taking place before is somewhat unknown. Um, and then, of course, also we have the Synaxarium or Synkesar, which contains a daily commemoration for saints and other feasts. And this is read during Satat or the, the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, but I'll say that not every church um, actually reads the Synaxarium during Satat. They might actually read, say, um, like seven different miracle accounts and then not read the Synaxarium. Um, Sorry, so just, Augustinos, um, do they ever read the Synaxarium in the Divine Liturgy after the Acts of the Apostles the way the Copts do? No. No, it's never read during liturgy. And the Synaxarium itself was also a late translation. Uh, I mean, late, <laughs> later translation, anyways. Hmm. Um, there seems to be some relationship also with the with Dugwa, which I'm about to mention, um, that Dugwa also has a, a sort of calendar of commemorations. Um, but again, it's not well understood how this might have been used in the past, and it's, it's not so much the case anymore. Um, and, the, and the Synaxarium also contains uh, short verses, which are meant to be chanted um, after uh, the commemorations are read. So there's one for each saint, basically. Um, and the antiphonaries, so what I've been kind of referring to uh, all this time, um, I'm, I'm honestly not going to say a lot about these because it's really, really, really complicated what each of the books are, how they're used, and how they're maybe not used anymore. Um, but so these are all attributed to the famous uh, sixth century saint uh, Yared, the hymnographer, whom again I'll mention in a, in a moment. Um, and, there, and there's five of them, perhaps originally four. Uh, these are Dugwa, Soma Dugwa, and this is the, the form of Dugwa that's used for Lent. Uh, Zimare, Moa Aset, and Mura. And so these books would, uh, are, are, components of these books are used during the divine office and during Mahalit. Um, it's questionable how much of the content actually dates to this time of Yared when he might have existed, and it's debated the extent to which he was a historical person. Uh, but in any case, um, th these books are, are, I mean, uh, they are important, but um, it, it's quite complicated and a lot of what they were originally used for seems to have fallen away. Um, so moving on to chanting and hymns, I'll start first by talking about um, the actual composers. So um, of course, some texts were actually just translated either from Greek or Arabic. We have the Psalms, obviously. Um, the daily Theotokia are borrowed from, from Coptic. Um, and of, of course, there's a, a number of other things that were simply translated and which are common to, to most Christian uh, denominations. Um, but as I said, there's uh, an incredible, incredible, overwhelming amount of material composed in Gez. Um, so many composers, I couldn't possibly go through all of them. And some, you know, we might not even know any historical details about. Um, the two that I'll talk about are the ones that have come up a lot so far already is uh, Saint, First St. Saint Yard, the hymnographer. Uh, who lived during the sixth century. He taught, he was a, a chant teacher in Aksum. Uh, and as I said, he composed the main collection of antiphonaries. Uh, he has an incredibly high reputation among um, uh, the, the sort of um, study of Gez literature. Um, and so as a result of this reputation, many later hymns end up being ascribed to him, including ones that are for saints who lived several hundred years after he died, quite anachronistically. Um, but this is, again, simply a, a symptom of his reputation that um, he's so famous that people would just like to assume that he had written so many of these things. Um, also, of course, we have Abba Georgis of Segla, who uh, lived from the late thir uh, 13th century to the early 14th century. Uh, he's an, he was an incredibly prolific hymnographer and a theologian. So he wrote both many books of Marian hymns and how most of these hymns are used is, um, I, I would say it's not incredibly clear. I don't know when anyone would necessarily, like, in a liturgy or, or some sort of service, use some of the, a lot of the hymns that he wrote, <laughs> but they, they're there. Um, and he also wrote a number of uh, theological treatises. 
Um, and it's, as I said, to him that is attributed this development of a uniquely Ethiopian liturgy of the hours, or Se'atat. And he seems to also have been the composer of several anaphoras, although his name isn't attached to them. Um, and I'll note that there's similar themes in the, in the lives of St. Yard and Abba Georgi. So both, were, both are said to have initially been completely unable to learn or, or to sing. So it said that uh, St. Yard couldn't understand the most basic chants that they had at the time. Uh, and the Abba Georgis, after seven years, still could not learn how to pronounce a single letter of the alphabet. And then in both cases, there was a, a moment of a miraculous epiphany. And then suddenly they produce, you know, in one sitting, this enormous literary output that, you know, St. Yard, who didn't know how to, how to make any, you know, musical intonation, suddenly develops an entire system of chant, five books of antiphons, you know, all of this suddenly. And, and the same for Abba Georgi, so he couldn't, he didn't know how to write down a single letter or how to pronounce it. And then suddenly he composes a huge number of hymns and uh, theological treatises. Um, and Abba Georgi himself too actually had quite um, a high level of learning. He, he seems to have known a lot of uh, vocabulary that was later lost based on Greek and, and other uh, more complex uh, sources. Um, and he seems to have ac had access to sources that are now lost in Giz, um, certain patristic writings and other sources. Um, oh, I should just say, so uh, this is a, a, a picture of St. Yared. Um, so he holds the traditional instruments and then there's three birds, one of which is cut off um, for the, the three modes of chant, which you can see here. Um, but I'll first talk about RK. Uh, so RK isn't really the proper name uh, either for the type of chant or for the, the hymn, but I use it out of simplicity that it's RK is a very paradigmatic example. Um, so in this case, we have stanzas that are usually uh, five lines. In, in some cases, as few as three or as many as seven. Uh, each of the lines, and I have an example uh, right after this, each of the lines um, ends in the same syllable to create a sort of rhyme. And the typical way of chanting them is antiphonal, where if you have a group of cantors, uh, each one will take turns uh, individually chanting the first two lines, and then uh, together they'll all complete the remaining three lines with a different, one, a different person beginning each uh, stanza. Um, and also I should note that there are, um, across all of the, the, the um, the chanting traditions of, uh, in Ethiopic, there are three um, modes or, or tones, which are again attributed to St. Yared. Uh, the first is ge'ez, which is um, plain and straightforward. Uh, izel, which is characterized by being a, a more gentle sound. And then arri, which is somber and often very drawn out. And it's perhaps hard to actually distinguish if you're hearing which of these it is. Uh, and certainly I, you know, I can't quite say too much about it. Um, and I'll say here too, just for this manuscript that you see, there's also a, um, a unique system of chant notation in Ethiopic. So there are some symbols that, in, that indicate the tone, um, you know, different sort of uh, like lines and dots. Um, and then also, as you can see, small words, which are actually references to other chants, which are better known, how, how those are chanted. And so then those are you, this is sort of a reference to say, this is chanted like that other thing is chanted, assuming that people know what that other thing is, right? So then it's incredibly demanding. To, to be able to read these because you have to know a lot. And in this case, you only see maybe two levels, but I can show you uh, maybe quickly. Um, sometimes you get, uh, it's, it might be hard to see, but w uh, several different levels of chant, depending on different occasions. Um, so it's, yeah, it's quite complicated. Um, so uh, for chants, as I said, a lot of uh, elements that are chanted are taken from the antiphonaries, particularly those that are used uh, for Mahalayat and Divine Office. Uh, many different kinds of hymns, again, as I said, such as some of Abba Georgis' hymns, don't seem to have a clear uh, guide for usage. Um, a very common kind of hymn that I'll point out because it's, it's particularly noteworthy is, is called Melk, which means image. And these are hymns that are addressed to a particular saint or, or an angel, and it praises the saint by way of addressing their body parts. So they typically have around 50 verses, right? So it'll be, you know, greetings to your head, blah, 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 greetings to your face, greetings to your, you know, from head to toe. Amazing. Um, and these stanzas are done in an RK style. So uh, each of the verses or stanzas is five lines rhymed and, and so on. Um, and then also worthy of note, which isn't really a type of hymn, is uh, kene. So kene are poems that are spontaneously composed by someone who studied kene. Um, it's considered to be uh, the, 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 the greatest of the, the skills because it requires so much education and practice. And in most cases now it's limited just to special occasions since it requires someone who's uh, you know, studied and, and practiced for so long. And I'll say a bit more about education later. 
Um, so here I have an example of um, a verse from a mouth. This is Malka Mariam. Um, I promise this is the most guys I have on any one slide, just to show that you can see that each line ends in who. So it's a frohu, bakhinafi hu, tserhu, elahu, melkahu. Um, and then there'll be audio that demonstrates um, the, the, the sound of it and the sort of antiphonal nature. And I have some more examples later too. <laughs> I also have an example for Kane, which I might fast forward because it's really long. And already, I only give you a single line, and it's, I don't know, I think seven lines long. Um, the, in this case, this is a form of presented Kane known as uh, master student or teacher student. So the student stands in front and does the actual chanting, while the, the master, who himself is the one composing, stands behind. Uh, he will say what the, the line is, and then the, the, the student will chant that line. And while the student chants, the, the master thinks of what the next line will be, since he's spontaneously coming up with it in his mind. Unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, it goes on for a really long time, but I was just that's show that awesome. You can see them composing the line, you know, one at a time. Um, and so then, uh, as I was kind of referring to, so in terms of education, so all of the forms of chants, so for, so liturgy, each of the antiphons. Uh, and Kene, as we just saw, these are there are specialized traditional schools that teach each of these. Mm. So, you know, you have a school for Kene, and then a school for liturgy, and then a school for Dugwa, a school for Zamare, and so on. Um, and these are typically attached to churches or monasteries. Um, there are also, of course, schools that cover the, the use of the liturgical instruments, and then also schools for biblical and patristic exegesis. Uh, and the different regions are known, the schools in different regions are known to specialize in, in, in certain forms. So, so every region has, a, has each kind of school, but um, certain regions are known for having better schools in one area. So, so one area might be known to have the best, um, like Adaze school, another area, the best uh, drum school. of the best are the people who travel around learning from all the schools. Um, to master any one school can take a, a number of years, perhaps even decades. Um, and, and traditionally, uh, students devote all of their time to memorization and learning, um, often the expense of being able to, to get food in there for having to beg for food. Um, moving on to vestments. So um, really in the Ethiopian church, there's a single basic vestment, which all clergy, uh, deacons, priests, and bishops can wear. Um, and this you can uh, see here. So it, uh, it's basically a chasuble and it looks like it's two pieces, but it's one piece. It's a chasuble that has five strips that hang down. Um, uh, and then um, for, in the case of priests and bishops, of course, they will wear over top the stole or the epitrochelion. Uh, in the case of bishops, there's an additional garment, that, uh, a vestment that they can choose to wear instead, uh, which is a bit like a cape and known as a kaba, so you can see it here. Um, in some cases, priests will also wear this, but that's not considered to be correct. It often mostly happens in the diaspora. Um, and then in the case of lay people, they typically dress in white cloth, often a thin sheet known as uh, shama netala or simply netala, um, and it's crossed over the chest, as you can see here. Um, and of course, women also will cover their hair with a similar uh, piece of cloth. Um, processional crosses, I mean, that's not, you know, most churches have processional crosses, but in this case, I just wanted to note, of course, that Ethiopians have a, a wide range of unique styles of processional crosses, and these are carried by the lead deacon, um, 
priests and bishops also have hand crosses, as, it, as in the Coptic church. Um, and, and these are, of course, carried both inside the church and also outside of the church. Uh, and then perhaps the most notable Ethiopian, uh, uh, you know, liturgical item, the, the dibbab or canopy. Uh, so where other churches have rapidia or fans, um, in, the, in Ethiopia we have the, the dibbab. Um, so this seems to have a, a, an origin in what was um, reserved for the kings, that the kings would have, you know, people who hold canopies over them. And then it was, its use was extended to the church. Um, it's held over the gospel, it's held over um, when communion is being served, over the tabot, even over uh, the miracles of Mary when it's being read. Um, in the past, it would have been a fixed um, sort of um, like a parasol or awning, um, but of course now they simply use uh, collapsible umbrellas because they're cheaper and easier. Um, and then also the tabot, as I mentioned, so this is um, the, the, the altar tablet that consecrates an altar in place of the antimens, which we would know from the Byzantine tradition. Uh, it represents the tablets that were in the Ark of the Covenant, and so then by extension is seen as representing the Ark itself. Uh, each tablet is consecrated to a specific saint or angel in connection to the, patron, the patronage of the particular church. Uh, it typically ends up being processed uh, during Theophany, as well as the, the feast of the saint that the tablet is consecrated to. And we see examples here of um, when the priest takes the tablet out to process it, he uh, wraps it in a cloth and carries it on his head. Um, and a church can have multiple tabotats uh, to allow for them to have multiple processions throughout the year for different saints. Um, in the past, it was basically a requirement that, a church, that every church have at least one tabot from Mary and usually also from Michael and Gabriel. But now it's often the case that a church might only have a single tabot for whoever their patron saint is. But, but some, uh, you know, like the, 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 the cathedral, for example, has um, three tabots. Um, the liturgical instruments, which I've been building up to, and this is another photo of St. Yared. So the use of musical instruments is not at all permitted during divine liturgy or the liturgy of the hours or during fast periods. Um, but it, it is uh, permitted for mahalait. Um, and as mentioned previously, the instruction and the use of uh, instruments is part of the traditional uh, religious education system. Um, there are three instruments that are particularly, uh, or the, the, the instruments that are allowed are limited to three. So um, the drum, the kabaro, the sistrum, sanato, which is maybe, you know, a lot of people aren't used to what a sistrum is now. Um, and the, the staff called mequamia. Um, so uh, here we have, uh, so the, the drum is itself a large goatskin drum uh, with a large side and a small side, which produce um, more bassy and less bassy sounds. While the sistrum is uh, basically like a rattle um, and has its origins actually in ancient Egypt, perhaps one of the earliest musical instruments. Um, and this. Um, and that's that's from Mahalet. Uh, in the case of the staff, Mukwamia. Um, this is a wooden staff topped with a, a distinctively shaped head, which can often be made of metal and decorated, though it could also just simply be wood. Uh, it does have the basic function of simply serving as a crutch to, to help for standing for long periods. But it's also, uh, people would take offense if I said that because they would say that they would emphasize that it is really an instrument. Um, and there's a specific form of use for it that accompanies chanting, which... Um, <laughs> Also, where I have some example clips. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the times, so but I'll try to keep them shorter. Um, so this is from the Divine Liturgy. So this is a, I tried to pick moments, a moment in the Divine Liturgy that was a bit more unique uh, and not just, you know, simply behind, priests behind the altar talking. <laughs> so in this case, this is when uh, the priest, or uh, yeah, in this case, it's the priest, uh, senses the church and then um, 
after he does what um, you, you'll see the ritual after he does this he then senses all of the people he goes around sensing all the people during the, the scripture reading <laughs> So they just do the same thing. Um, but uh, I'll also point out that the movement is always done counterclockwise. Um, I, I won't show the, the prayer of the covenant just for the sake of time. Um, here's an example from Mahalate. So this would be a similar antiphonal style five line um, stanzas. And you can hear perhaps better the sort of antiphonal chanting where um, the cantors take turns. Um, though this. <laughs> So at this point, this is when they switch to a longer drawn out style. So they'll take the last two lines of the last verse and then sing those again over a very long drawn out style. And then when they finish, come back to doing new verses. Um, and so this would be an example that I sort of it. No. transition between trans styles um, and then to fast forward a bit there'll be yet another one <laughs> So you can see this progression over the course of Mahalalai between so many different styles of chanting and then often concluding with, as I said, this form of dance. Or Will slowly get uh, faster, um, but again, I, I really want to be conscious of the time. Um, 
So, uh, I mean, I can skip through a lot of this because I think you already had said, Brian, a lot of this. So that the largest, of course, jurisdiction currently is the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewaito Church. Um, and there's two patriarchs currently as a result of um, a, a long-standing schism that was recently resolved. Um, uh, also, of course, we have the Eritrean uh, Orthodox Church, which currently does not have a patriarch. Uh, two Eastern Catholic uh, churches, which again, I, I think you already said all of this, so I, I'll skip through that. Um, there's, there's still a large monastic tradition, perhaps uh, the current numbers are somewhat exaggerated, um, but they're still quite large. Uh, within most parish communities, though, they prefer to use vernaculars as much as they can. They still use Ge'ez to some extent, but they tend to prefer um, introducing Amharic and Tigrinya. And it's mostly just in monasteries that everything is completely done start to finish in Ge'ez. Um, we also have communities, of course, in North America, um, which, both, which basically just recreate these experiences using Amharic instead of English. Um, except for uh, the Afro-Caribbean communities, these were founded by Abuna Yetzak, who was sent to Jamaica to evangelize Rastafarians in the 1970s. Um, though he did little to, to change the local customs that the Rastafarians had introduced. Um, and in any case, uh, so they, 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 they allowed for a large uh, usage of English, even within the liturgy, which is somewhat controversial. But they don't, they never had the, the proper materials. So Abuna Yasak never established a seminary or gave people adequate instruction in, in being a priest or in theology um, or in, in chanting. Um, but there have been, there are current attempts to try to fix this. So to establish a new seminary and to establish proper translations. But for now, the translations are sort of across the board and even some things haven't been translated at all and they just skip them. Um, but yeah, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully that improves. Um, and so, yeah, that's, uh, oh, I had some there examples. Is, and there is a Jamaican, music. there's a Jamaican Ethiopian parish in Toronto. So again, right. if COVID passes, you can actually go visit this J a Jamaican Ethiopian Orthodox church. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll really skip through these, but also to know, because I know Brian, you love these, are um, popular religious music. So these are not liturgical and they're usually in the vernacular. And in this yeah. case, other instruments are allowed too, but still only traditional Ethiopian instruments, not Western ones. Um, so here's one example. The audio is bad, but that's to show the. So this is a uh, And then I have here too. This is piano. Uh, this instrument is called a car. I realize I need to leave sometime. So, okay. I like uh, his sunglasses. Well, so he's blind. Oh. Yeah, so, so he- <laughs> That's he, embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's able to tune and play uh, the krar, like this harp, completely uh, blind. And blindness is quite common, right? Since priests read in the dark, um, you know, maybe issues with water quality and, and medical care. And, you know. Um, so, so it's quite common that a lot of these um, more educated or, you know, sort of individuals end up being uh, blind. Lots of sunglasses in some monasteries, let's say. Hmm. Absolutely fascinating. Um, just so grateful that uh, Augustinus has uh, graced us with this presentation. So I'm sure you have lots of comments and questions. So in the remaining time, let's please uh, make, uh, address your, your questions and concern. This is your chance. This may be as close as you get to Lali Bella talking to Augustinus. So. so, excuse me, Augustino. I have a question about the servicing of uh, prothesis at the beginning of the liturgy by Ethiopian, uh, Ethi Ethiopian church. Uh, serving which? The prothesis, uh, like proscomedia. Proscomedia, yeah. They do not have a separate table. They have uh, all gifts on the altar already prepared. Do they have a, a great entrance or no? Yeah, so um, I, I saw this was in your slides, Brian. I don't know if you mentioned it. So um, the communion elements are prepared in a separate um, location called Beit Lehem. In Ethiopia, it will actually be a separate building from the church, though in, in the diaspora, of course, it often ends up being uh, just a different room. Um, and then there's a procession that's not uh, public. Um, so usually, um, so Beit Lehem is usually, the, the, the area where the communion is prepared is usually kind of off where people can't see. The deacons carry it to the, to the church as the liturgy begins. 
and it's all done mostly in a way that the people can't see. So you wouldn't even know that there was this uh, the great entrance going on um, because it's it's mostly hidden. It's like the procession of the lamb in the Coptic church, but that is uh, the people can participate in that. So it's the same structurally the same thing, but it, it's done behind the curtain here. I mean, you might see like somewhere like Lalibela, you probably could see it because there's only so much space <laughs> space that they can walk around and stand. Mm -hmm. But it's mostly meant to be closed off now. And do you use just one loaf for no matter the size of number of communicants that from which everyone breaks, or can they have multiple loaves? I don't know, to be honest. That that sort of information is usually kept secret. The the Ethiopians are very hesitant to talk about whatever goes on behind the altar. Uh, uh -huh. Uh, I mean, I will say that there was one Sunday that I saw them run out of um, the wine and then somehow go back and get another mysterious goblet of wine from somewhere. But... Other questions, comments, please? Uh, yes, uh, curious about a couple things. One, one is, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a, a staff or a cane that they're all carrying. Mm, which is taught by one of these. Yes. And no, now, how, is that just a, you know, is, is that some, something that developed over time because there's that artifact, but then I'm also possibly thinking, well, it might not work in Ethiopia. Is that related to being a shepherd? Didn't you say that no. it's technically a musical instrument? Yeah. Um, I've never seen any explanation of the historical origin of it. Ethiopians will, will point out that, um, if you look at like recreations of um, like the Sanhedrin and like these early Jewish communities, they actually have staffs that look like this. And if you rewatch Passion of the Christ, I think it is, they actually, you, you see these. Um, but I mean, I, I, who knows what the specific origin is. Um, and, and so most of the time, I mean, they don't really serve a function during the liturgy. People just use them to help stand. And it's somewhat even um, of an honor if you have one. Um, but it, when, it, when it functions as an instrument, it's really just through mahale, when um, it's, it's moved around in this way. And then you can't really hear it, but there's a moment where also they kind of let it drop, and then that would produce you know, a somewhat, somewhat of a sound, which is maybe what qualifies it as an instrument. And then also seeing the, the, the architecture of the church with the, I forget the proper word, the altar, mm -hmm. the square that's in the center of the circle. Yeah, so only in circular churches, right? So in rectangular basilicas, it would be the, the, basically apps. the same layout as you would have yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. Um, the Not circular churches, so the, the, the theory that I subscribe to regarding the circular churches is that um, when, when the, the, the Adelite uh, armies invaded, the, the Muslim armies invaded uh, around the 17th century, 16th, 15th century, um, they burned almost all of the churches, basically all of the churches. Um, but the, the traditional style of building for Ethiopians, like so churches perhaps would have only been basilica at this point. Uh -huh. but the traditional buildings that people use for houses and, you know, for these sorts of things were always circular, I mean, basically huts. I, I mean, that's a bit of an offensive term, but, you know, just circular huts with a straw roof. And so the theory is that once um, the, the, the invading armies were kicked out and they were able to rebuild churches, the quickest and most efficient way was to use the buildings they knew how to build quickest yeah. which were circular and this and then, well, perhaps the order what struck me was if i'm saying the right name for in terms of uh I islam is mecca is it mecca where mm -hmm. pilgrims come in and circle the square thing in the middle mm -hmm. but that's part of a pilgrimage but it's still a, a sacred site i'm not sure if that's something that's more common in the ancient near east and that's just fil it's filtered down to some extent in terms of, you know, how just how they built their things. Like to me, it was like, oh, that reminds me of like you see the procession, with, mm. in a sense, what it might be for Muslims an altar that's in the center. Now it's a stone building instead of something else, but there's, you know, an architectural similarity, but also. Mm -hmm desertish peoples in the same time. The thing is that not all the sides are open though. So typically with a circular church, um, a portion of the circle that surrounds the square, if you follow me, is for men and then a portion is for women. And uh -huh. then a larger portion is for the priests. So it's basically impossible to actually go all the way around oh, yeah, uh, the altar, right? So it, you would only be stuck standing <clears throat> in, one, in one area. 
And in theory, part of part is also meant to be set off for the cantors. Um, but it, I mean, it differs, you know, from from church to church. It's not so consistent all of the time. I have a question. How did you end up in uh, the Ethiopian church? Then? <laughs> it's a long question that we need to have over a cup of coffee or some beer or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can say that conversion question. in the Ethiopian church is quite unusual. Um, and there's not really a, a, a good process laid out for conversion. I would, I, I would honestly say for most people, if they convert, they should go to the, the Coptic church. I mean, I, I know it is, so it's not so much of a problem for me, but I think for most people, it would be, it, it would just be such a hassle and a detriment to them to try to be a non-Ethiopian in the Ethiopian church, not understanding what's going on, you know, being somewhat foreign. And, you know. But Augustinos, given his erudition and piety, <laughs> will become a priest at some point. I hope not. I hope not. Non Ethiopians. And, uh, <laughs> I do also have a system I forgot to mention. If people wanted a sort of better, like, 360 shot of it, mine has a bit of a different pitch because it's made of silver, not brass. So it's a bit of a different sound. But you can see it has these sort of washers that just slide back and forth. And that's what produces the sound. Good. Other questions, comments? Natalia? A question about the schooling for priests. So how, what's the process of seminary training or training for, for ordained clergy? Mm -hmm. So now there's um, a, a typical seminary style that awards degrees and, you know, all, <laughs> all that stuff in, uh, in Addis. Um, uh, traditionally, it, uh, it was more rooted in the traditional school system. Um, so a deacon would have to memorize uh, all of the psalms, um, all of the chants for the liturgy, and then demonstrate that they could do that. So basically, um, a bishop would kind of give them an oral exam to see if they know adequately all the things they're supposed to know. Um, and then as they progress, you know, they'll become a priest. And then if they're a monk, they could they have the option to become a bishop. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's still some of an oral exam process. But in the diaspora, they'll often end up doing the education after the ordination. So a child will be ordained as a deacon and then educated sort of um, on the job, so to speak. Whereas in Ethiopia, they would do the reverse. They would expect that the, someone knows already everything they need to know before they're ordained as a deacon. Hmm. Which is similar to in the Coptic church, I think. They ordain children. Wow. Can I ask, I walked in um, when I'm near Dufferin and Bloor or when I'm near the um, Ethiopian church, I believe um, just on the south east side of the Danforth there, mm -hmm. um, I'll run into these wonderful Ethiopian women with the cross tattoo on their forehead. And it's, it just brightens my day. I, I love to see it. Is that simply cultural or, or uh, when did that enter into this? So during the reign of Zarya Yaakob, whom I've mentioned a whole lot, um, he, uh, he was both, he both instituted all these religious reforms, which I've said, you know, at length, um, but he also was quite repressive in terms of um, persecuting people who disagreed with him. Um, and one of the things that he was particularly keen on was magic and persecuting people who uh, practiced what was considered to be magic. Uh, he even executed, uh, I think, seven of his own children for being accused of practicing magic. Unbelievable. Um, and so one of the requirements that he instituted was that people had to have three tattoos to prove that they were orthodox. So they had to have a tattoo on uh, their right arm that said, uh, I reject the devil and I'm a servant uh, of Christ. And then on the, the left arm, they had to have a tattoo that said, I reject um, Dask the Accursed, who is a, a, a cult demon. Um, and I'm a servant of Mary, who is the mother of the maker of the universe. And then on the forehead, they had to have a, a tattoo that said, um, I am of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, so presumably out of this sort of tradition of um, mandatory tattoos, um, mm -hmm. you know, people could easily get a cross tattoo, and, uh, you know, because it's not obviously, a, it, it, presumably it didn't last long. People don't, you know, people don't have these tattoos anymore. Um, but certainly I would imagine that the cross tradition, you know, sort of, comes out of that or relates to that. Cops, cops um, get tattoos on their wrists. And Zarya Yaakov says that his tattoos are better, that he's that they're better than cops because their tattoos are are big are longer and more important. 
there's all the cops they just have these little crosses but we got these like theological <laughs> statements on our you know <laughs> one more question or comment and then we'll conclude noel anyone well, well if, if, if no one else has a question for uh for augustinus what what caught what do the cops have tattooed on their wrists? A cross. Oh, oh crosses. Little, little crosses usually. Yeah. yeah. But, but in this case, it's not so, um, it's not so much like a creedal thing. Like it's not to prove, uh, right. Right? It, it's more so in connection to like the oppression of Islam, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. I see. I see. In Ethiopia, it was, you know, okay, he's not a magician, so I don't have, so he, I won't kill him. Speaking of magic, Augustinus's doctoral work up till now has focused on the so-called magic scrolls. Uh, in, in the Ethiopian tradition. So on another occasion, uh, you'll have to you'll have to take him out for a beer and let him talk about Ethiopian magic with you, which is really interesting. We had him give a presentation on them at the Institute. Actually, we may have a, a video of that online now that I think of it. Um, once again, I want to thank Augustinos. Uh, after we conclude in prayer, if you're willing to stick around for five or ten minutes more, Augustinos, there, we, we've had a bit of a custom of just sort of hanging out a bit longer for yeah, people who may have had some additional questions. Uh, they may want to come back to you with that conversion story. Um, but you see people, just what a rich world this is and how really we could not have called this course anything but introduction because we could have a whole course on the Ethiopian tradition and maybe you know, God willing, in the future, we'll be able to bring Augustinus back and uh, hire him as a session lecture and have him give a, a whole course on the Ethiopian tradition. And it really challenges our, our perception of, of what's normal, right? In, a, you know, we all have our idea about what's normal in Christianity because of either the traditions that we've been raised in or grown up in. And there's just so much that is so distinctive here that it, it, at the very least, it can give us a epistemological humility, you know, with respect to our understanding of theology, spirituality, liturgy, and so forth. Um, so uh, I will ask you, uh, Augustinus, would you mind chanting uh, uh, maybe a Marian prayer or whatever appropriate uh, for us, something that you know and would like as a, as a concluding prayer, maybe just tell people what you're going to sing and uh, we'll conclude with that. Sure. I mean, I could do, um, you heard, so the, the verse that I gave from Malcolm Mariam was the second verse. So I could do um, the first three verses. Excellent. The, the thing is, they're not as good examples of the rhyme. The, the second verse is the best <laughs> rhyming. Our, I don't know that anybody here has sufficient grasp of Gez that they will be too troubled by, by that. I do offer now tutoring in Gez, if anyone's crazy <laughs> enough to want to start. But uh, OK. Salam, salam, lezikrasam, kihawas, aminakal, and elkwas, mwes, and blood, mwes. Maria, then get a visit a bit as a ziskayani, the letter bahu and a fakreki aziz. Come on, yes, a key ho, he's a senai aras. Salam, setter a seki, setter a dezafro. La buki bacnafu, Maria, then get a ziab hits a hula gabreki, zetia. He tried again, he allowed. Come on, you better need a item of Namakahu. Salam, seki. Look about a dozen of us, a cocobic baroness, Marian, then you're not a cigar and a science a honey, a minute of course, the firm of Urbanu, Kadus, as a day of the Sugafis, a semi Kazis. Thank you so much, Amma Saganalo. My pleasure. So, and actually, would you mind sending us a, a PDF of your presentation tonight? And I can. Mm. Quirkus for the students. A lot of them like to go over and, and, and revisit some of the material. We'll let people sign off now. Um, if you're signing off, have a wonderful weekend. Uh, try to recover on the two Sabbaths that we're about to have <laughs> city of your work this week. And we look forward to seeing you on Monday when we will uh, uh, look at the Armenian uh, uh, tradition. Okay, good night. Thank Thanks, Augustinas. Thank you Thank both. You. My pleasure. Everyone have a good weekend. <laughs> Anyone who is sticking around, I invite you just to, uh, you can ask your questions of Augustinos. I'm listening. I just have to step away from the computer because I'm going to go for a run before sunset and I'm just going to listen to the, the d discussion while I get my running gear on.
I just um, had a question about the the mahalat. Is that what mm -hmm. it's called? Mm -hmm. Mahalat. Uh, with the, yeah, the different kinds of chanting. That's this sort of in the main room where the liturgy might be in behind. Is what you were saying? So saata. So um, mahalat doesn't overlap with a divine liturgy. Um, it overlaps with uh, the liturgy of the hours. So the ending of mahalat would also be the ending of the liturgy of the hours, and then the divine liturgy would begin. Oh, okay. Um, there's a, there's this, when, when I was watching it, there's a sense I just wanted to join them. Um, th there's a, there's a camaraderie, um, like we're all hanging out, uh, feeling, um, and we're kind of riffing on <laughs> some chants. Yeah. And I don't know if that's the, the intent. Um, it, it, it has a casualness and friendliness about it. Is that, is that the intention or like it doesn't it doesn't feel like a formal liturgy thing it feels more like uh i don't know um it's an important time to gather and hang out familial yeah i mean so the point of mahalate is really to to emphasize the beauty of um the church and and beauty through prayer um Certainly, uh, like, so, so the mahalate that's performed as a, as a service in, in the church is meant to be very refined and is taken somewhat seriously. Um, but when they're studying in the traditional school, um, they're sort of doing a similar style, but it's a lot more relaxed. So where in church, um, so, so the example I had for Kene, where he was composing spontaneously, this was um, a Kene in honor of St. Samuel of Wildeba. But in the school, people might compose kane for just everyday things. They may compose kane about a friend or something they enjoy doing, or, you know, um, which actually helps because it gives them an exposure to more vocabulary than they might have if they only just kept talking about saints all the time. You know, you just only have the same words or instead of, you know, building your vocabulary. Um, so, so assuming in the schools, it, ha it can have a, a very camaraderie sense or a sense of com camaraderie. But in the, in the church, it's meant to be a bit more refined and serious. But it's still, as you, as you know, it still kind of retains some of that character, for sure. And the, the dancing part uh, that we saw uh, mm. is beautiful. It's very uh, sort of a formalized back and forth thing. <laughs> um, it, that's part of the Mahalay as well? Yeah, or, that's part of Mahalay as well. And yeah. that's, that's only it. There's not like other yeah. styles or, or, you know, it's just that. Um, yeah. Except that they'll pick up the speed and, and, and move faster. Yeah. And, and then and the just, sorry, and just to say, so this is also attributed to St. Yared. So, so St. Yared is, again, considered to be the person who came up with the, the movements and, and the choreography. Oh, okay. So he was moved by the music. Um, <laughs> um, the guy with the staff, when he was doing the chanting, mm. sorry, I shouldn't say guy. Um, He's in Toronto, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was in Toronto. It, it was almost getting into theater, like using the staff as an expression. Is, mm -hmm. Am I reading into it? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, the movement is related to the chant. Um, uh, and I mean, all I can say is that again, this is actually, <laughs> this all comes from St. Yared, at least supposedly. Um, and, and there's been some, it hasn't been studied adequately enough um, like how these are taught and how they develop. Um, it, it's, it's a notable sort of lacuna in scholarship is how the traditional schools really function and um, how they differ from school to school and from region to region. Um, so, so for the schools that are known to specialize in instruments, you know, are they always the same and how do they compare? It's not really you know, adequately well known. And for the most part, not many, not many people have quite the level of knowledge. The reason, the reason why I chose that video clip was because um, that Marigeta, Marigeta Tesfa has um, an adequate level of knowledge to actually do a good job of the, the movement of the staff. In most cases, people aren't really well trained or experienced in doing it. And so they just do a very simplistic sort of watered down version. Yeah, um, it was a very special experience. Um, it, it felt inviting and, and joyous and at the same time so, so different and foreign. I, it's, it's a very unusual experience to, to experience mm. that together. Uh, phenomenal. Yeah, and I mean, again, to really point out, like all of these things are only found in Mahalate, and that's why I focused on it more than the liturgy, like the divine liturgy, 
because the divine liturgy is just more or less what we're for, what we're used to in other traditions. I mean, of course, there's some you know extra prayers or some differentiation, but there's not all of this extra richness that we see in uh, Mahale. And so, I guess my final question is to that point: the Mahale. How would you like? Is it's not really like vespers or matins. It's it's something else. Yeah, I mean, it really borrows all of these um, like hymns, uh, a lot of hymns at least that get inserted into, uh, that would have been inserted into Vespers. So for example, like I gave you the um, Melka Mariam, which is just a regular hymn for the Virgin Mary that praises her, um, but this will be used in um, Mahlet. So and in theory, I think it can also be used in, um, in the other forms. And Kene too. So Kene is not only actually part of Mahalet, Kene is also part of um, Moades uh, and um, Wazema. Um, but it's maybe, but maybe these elements are a bit more subdued in the usual sort of uh, like Vespers and Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, phenomenal experience. Thank you so much for sharing. My pleasure. Really my pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Patrick, are you still there? I'm I'm just lurking and listening. <laughs> okay, I, good. I have nothing in particular to ask, but I wanted to hear what other people had to say. Also, I should remember to send you, Brian. Um, uh, there's a video that BBC has. BBC actually did two videos, but one of them isn't quite so relevant. Um, but uh, that maybe is a better replacement for the National Geographic one. It's not oh, maybe really? so detailed. Sure. Yeah, so, so the BBC, they have one where they follow um, a woman who gets her uh, infant baptized. Mm. Um, and this is at uh, the church of Abuna Yamata Gu, which is very Fantastic. famous because it's in a cave that's up on top of a, a mountain. And so you have yeah. to climb into these like rock ledges to get to it. That's, that's the chapel in the sky. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, hey, so yeah. there's a video that shows like, I mean, they're very short, but these little clips of the baptism ceremony. Oh, um, cool. Okay, great, great. Just because it really pains me to hear a British woman in a monotone voice say Giez and Tim Cat. <laughs> <laughs> and then it does, it did feel a bit disingenuous to me that she said that Tim Cat is more prominent than everything else, because that's not true. I mean, Easter is more prominent than everything else. Right, no yeah, one should yeah. ever say that Easter is reduced compared to another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure, no, whatever you have to, to suggest, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll post it. Yeah. Great, Augustinos. Well, I'm gonna, um, we'll make, we're gonna, we, this has been recorded. So with your permission, we'll, we'll uh, post the recording to uh, Quirkus. And then if you could send the PowerPoint too. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I also, I also had, I had written notes, so I can, I'm fine with sending those too. Oh, fantastic, even better, okay. And uh, the thing is like, so actually pro most of my presentation would even be like publicly acceptable. So all of the photos were my own photos. I didn't use any oh, photos that were from wow. elsewhere. Oh, wow. Beautiful. No, beautiful photos. But the videos are the issue that the videos I just took from YouTube because, you know, I never thought to <laughs> record oh. so many of these all the time. But. Oh, I see. Don't worry. I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, yeah. these are basically just watching it. I don't know that they're going to be sharing it with anybody. No, else. no, no. Of course. But I'm saying, in, in, you know, in theory, if we cut the YouTube videos out, that could, it could be shared. If oh, okay. Shared. Okay. Even, even better than mine and you know all of the talk is mine well i'll let i'll let the students know that in that way if they do have peers or family members or somebody who pastors or whatever who want to learn some of these things then then that would be advantage for them too yeah. great okay well look forward to connecting again if you look i'm going to be in ottawa for i don't know how long but uh, under covid but uh, if i'm back in toronto are you in waterloo right now or toronto yeah waterloo because, um, okay, so uh, we'll, we'll see if we can connect. Jasmine wants to head back to Waterloo before the end of the summer to pick a couple of things up from her old place. So maybe we can come visit you then when we're out there in August. Sure, yeah, of course. So there. And I wanna, let's catch up sometime on the phone or something. I wanna hear what, where your itinerary is, to, your peregrination is taking you uh, with your academic uh, life. Yeah. It's kind of a mess, to be honest. No. <laughs> oh, God is on okay. his throne. All right, well, that's true. Well, then. Okay, good night. So, good night. Thank you again. It's a, it was my pleasure, really. So. Mm -hmm.